you. Uh, you talk about the speed of cyber, and I had a young staff sergeant who, so most paralegals don't do cyber. That is not common. We've had, we have maybe like five or six uh, paralegals in the Air Force who've ever touched cyber. And there was some briefing with like a pyramid about different speeds and different acquisition authorities. And at the very top was the fastest you could go. And I think it said three to six months. And he was very enthusiastic. He really wanted to learn his job. And he was, we were sitting in a meeting one day and someone said something about needing to move. Thank you. Am I loud enough? Oh, you need it for, oh, got it. All right. So he said something about needing to move at the speed of cyber. Uh, and, or no, someone said something about needing to move at the speed of cyber. And he goes, that's, that's three to six months, right? And he was dead serious. He, he believed that the speed of cyber was like a defined term and that that time limit was three to six months. So I, I love that. And so now I believe that the speed of cyber is three to six months. Um, let me start by telling you who I am because I think that matters a lot about what my perspective is. Uh, you can use who I am to judge my perspective if you so choose. Uh, so I'm a lawyer, sorry, uh, start with that. Uh, I am the lawyer for an operational commander. So I'm not at, I don't sit in the Pentagon, I don't advise four stars, I do advise a two star these days, but my perspective is very much operational. Uh, it is in very, very intentionally operational. I am not thinking about 10 years from now, I'm thinking about 10 days from now. And that very much colors my perspective and where I come from. Uh, it also necessitates this disclaimer, both of those things, both that I'm a lawyer, uh, I must have a disclaimer. Um, but also, my views are definitely not those of the Air Force as a whole or the Department of Defense as a whole. Um, so I won't just say do not necessarily represent. I promise you that at least some of my views uh, are just not the same. Uh, so take, take what I say as my opinion, as my perspective, um, although in some cases I'm actually also talking about what is the Air Force doing right now and those of you who are not Air Force, how you can theoretically potentially implement the same sort of a solution. So what's the problem in cyberspace, in cyberspace acquisition? Here is a 2015, so, so as a lawyer, I like to read congressional testimony. That's just it's a fun way to spend my time. Um, this is a 2015 congressional testimony. Uh, Admiral Rogers, US Cybercom commander, and all of the service chiefs were called to testify. And one of the questions that they were asked by Congress is, how are you guys doing on capability development? And every single one of them said something pretty close to this. So this is, this is truly a period in history in which we are falling behind if we are merely holding our position in the overall movement to forge new capabilities. The uh, Mar 4 Cyber Commander was a little more direct. Uh, he actually says, while global technology advances rapidly, the Marine Corps faces challenges in adapting its acquisitions to operate at the speed required of cyberspace. Spoiler alert, every single one of them except for the Air Force said something equally negative. Pretty much they all said we suck, um, which is depressing uh, because I don't want to suck. Uh, and actually that is one thing, every single time, uh, every change of command I've been to at 24th Air Force, that is the one thing the 24th Air Force commander says to his new commanders is, hey, if you could not suck, that would be great. Uh, and I, I think that's a, that's a great challenge. So why do we suck? Here are the answers that my clients have given me. Uh, lawyers, sorry. Uh, the acquisition system is broken. There is too much bureaucracy. Congress needs to do something. Uh, the system is too slow for cyber. What the system is, I don't know. What you mean when you say cyber, I also don't know. Uh, we suck at cybersecurity is another one. And then we need better supply chain control. These are all things I've been told. Uh, what is my problem with these complaints? They're not specific in any way. They're not actionable in any way. I can complain about bureaucracy all day, but unless you tell me a specific problem that you are having, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so what are some possible things we could go after? Um, Secretary Mattis heard that I was giving this talk, uh, and he kindly issued some guidance that I could use uh, in my talk. So he recently published on October 5th uh, the the subject of this was guidance from Secretary Jim Mattis, but had three overall objectives. And the third objective was my talk, um, or at least part of it, and I was super excited. 
Uh, so here are, a, here are a few things he says we need to do for our acquisition system as a whole. Um, these are the three that I liked. We've got develop a culture of rapid and meaningful innovation. That sounds fantastic. Uh, streamline requirements and acquisition processes. Also sounds good. Promote responsible risk taking. Yes, that, I mean, these are all things that I hear on a regular basis. We've also got these ones, which I like too, but seem to conflict possibly with the first three. Uh, instill budget discipline and effective resource management, protect infrastructure and intellectual property, improve information technology, business operations efficiency, and implement real cost accounting. So the reason I put these on two different slides is to highlight this contradiction that we have in the cyber business and certainly in cyber acquisitions, which is we, we want to do it all. We want to both have perfect cybersecurity, perfect, you know, infrastructure protection, no bugs, but at the same time, we would like it tomorrow. We would like it super fast. We would like it, you know, we would like to accept risk and accept failure. And you can't have all of that at the same time in the same acquisition. So how do we achieve this? This is my personal framework that is slightly more specific than it's too bureaucratic, but not much more specific. So sorry, this is all you're gonna get from me. Um, we need to recognize that we have conflicting priorities. You cannot have every single piece at the same time in every single acquisition for every single capability that you're trying to acquire. Uh, you need to treat different requirements differently. That seems obvious, but it's not, and especially not when you have a bunch of lawyers in a room talking about cyber without anybody who actually understands what they're talking about. Uh, you need to tailor risk acceptance to your objective. Also, I think something that's very easy to overlook um, I like to say that every time somebody screws something up, a new policy like gets its wings. Uh, and that's, it's true. I mean, it just, it, it's sad and it's frustrating and it's true. And if we have these general policies that apply to every single acquisition that we do, um, then it becomes almost impossible to achieve anything quickly. Uh, and then accept failure when it's an option. And that last one is kind of what my paper is about, which is identify specific barriers to success and challenge them. So you cannot say this entire system is too bureaucratic or Congress needs to do something. You have to say, hey, here's a specific challenge that I'm having. What can we do about this specific challenge? And you need to do that over and over and over again until the system stops being broken. So I did all that stuff first because it's slightly more interesting than fiscal law, um, which I mean, the only benefit here is that they gave you cookies and coffee before I talked. Because um, usually, I actually did a very similar talk to this last week, and they put me right after lunch. And I'm like, it's just cruel, and I'm sorry. So here is our fiscal law requisite background. Um, I actually was looking up, when I was preparing these slides, what have other lawyers done when they talk about fiscal law? I was looking for, I don't know, fun graphics or pithy phrases. And all I found is like all of these pictures of boxes with things inside of them. Um, like I saw a picture of a box with cats in it, I'm trying to think of what, there was one was just like an empty box, but the idea is with fiscal law, you do not think outside the box. And it's true. Like generally with fiscal law, you do not want to think outside the box. Um, people go to jail for thinking outside the box. Congress is very, very, very um, interested in making sure that you spend the money that they give you exactly how they told you that you can spend it, that you don't take any leeway, that you don't take advantage of any gray area. Um, and so basically something that no lawyer ever said is, you know, we're really pushing into the gray area with this fiscal law problem. Um, and that makes my topic, make some lawyers feel slightly uncomfortable. Uh, and I, although I don't necessarily see it as a fiscal gray area, so that helps. But uh, there's different types of funds. So for those of you who've been in acquisitions or who've done anything with acquisitions, you probably are familiar with things like operations and maintenance funds, which are for operations and maintenance. Uh, research development tests and evaluation, that is for your research development test and generally evaluation. Uh, and then uh, MILCON, so if you'd like to build a building, you need some MILCON money. Uh, we've got procurement funds if you're looking for any long-term investment. And what's important to know about the different types of funds is Congress requires you to spend the most specific fund that's applicable for what you're doing. So operations and maintenance is generally your broad, like, hey, anything that's operational, but if, for example, Congress were to give you an appropriation for 
computer keyboards. No idea why they would do this, but let's say they think we have a computer keyboard problem and we've been purchasing too many, maybe those ergonomic styles are just getting a little pricey. They could say, hey, the Air Force this year may spend $1,500 on computer keyboards and no more. What could have then been operations and maintenance last year, now with the more specific appropriation, would have to be funded with that new computer keyboard money. And the reason that that's important is because Research and development funds are generally considered to be more specific than op operations and maintenance. So if you can spend research and development, the idea is that generally you should. Uh, the problem with research and development funds is you don't get them at the operational level. And in cyber, when you do software development, that word development is in there. And I think it causes a lot of confusion among lawyers because software development and the development the term development as it's used in fiscal law mean two very different things. Uh, benefits and limitations of different funding types. The benefit to me of operations and maintenance funds is that my commander has that type of fund. Um, it's very flexible in that, so for example, if you have, if you are, let's just say you are the driver of a boat or you are the, I don't know, boats are a terrible example because I'm not Navy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a boat example anyway. So let's say you've got a boat and you've got some funds, some operations and maintenance funds, and you're gonna paint the boat because it's time to paint the boat. But as you're painting the boat, you notice that there's a giant hole in the side of the boat. You can very easily say, hey, I'm not gonna buy any more paint. I'm gonna actually go ahead and try to figure out what I need to do to patch this hole. Uh, and then you can take those funds and you can apply them to patching the hole. If you were doing research and development, you would have funds, say, for example, researching new and better paints. You cannot take those research new and better paints funds and start spending them on how the heck do we plug the hole in this boat. Um, so they're, they're less flexible. O&M funds are more flexible. Bottom line, I like O&M funds. So what has the Air Force done? They have found the exact limits of what you can do with O&M funds and they have regulated them into a policy and they have up to the limits of what you can do with O&M funds permitted you to use O&M funds on um, cyber capability development. So here is same testimony as the other service commanders. Uh, then AF Cyber Commander General uh, Wilson says, we are making gains in improving our acquisitions process to support the ever-changing technology of cyberspace. He then said some other words that were too long to put on one slide. Uh, talks about certain technical solutions that he has achieved, uh, that 24th Air Force has achieved. And he says, these technical solutions were developed and fielded in weeks to months. That is what the Air Force is doing in cyber capability development right now. Doesn't work for everything. It only works for things that meet these specific criteria. And these specific criteria are designed around fiscal law, designed around what it means to be operations and maintenance funds, what, it, what, what certain characteristics are necessary to be permitted to spend those types of funds. So we go with under two million. I think that's actually just uh, Air Force Space Command keeping us from becoming unruly. Um, and that's inflation tied, so it's actually about two and a half million right now. Uh, the way that, this, that we keep it operational and operates, operations and maintenance is it has, to be, it has to enhance or be linked to an existing operational system, platform, or capability. And that basically takes us from the, hey, I am developing something wholly new, which would definitely not be permissible with operations and maintenance funds, and takes us instead to, I have something that I am improving, that I am maintaining to keep me current. Uh, and then less than 180 days. That is because if you get much longer than 180 days, and this is from problem to solution, 180 days. One, it makes it very clear that this is an operational real term need. This is not some pie in the sky idea from the far future. Uh, two, it makes sure that you're not going to cross that investment criteria. This is an actual real world need today, not, not some long term planned solution that will require like a long sustainment arm. So with these three criteria, the Air Force says you may spend O&M funds generally to do this sort of development. What are the benefits? I think I've covered them at least some in my previous comments, but it's flexible, it's fast, it's available to operational commanders. I mean, that's important because when we're talking about a problem that needs a solution in weeks to months, you generally do not have time to go through the levels of bureaucracy that would be necessary to get approval at like, say, an Air Force level or even a DOD level. 
Um, now, some, some innovative ideas like DIUX, I know there's been a ton of talk about DIUX, and those are fantastic because DIUX works directly for Secretary Mattis. They do not have to go through levels of bureaucracy because they are at the very top. And that's fantastic, and to the extent that, that they can be used and that problems can be solved by them, I think that's great. But a lot of the problems don't make it to that level unless they've gone through all of those layers of bureaucracy already. What are the risks? This guidance is not DOD guidance. This is not a DOD policy. It's not documented in the financial management regulations. Uh, and then it's, for that reason, it's subject to any change in law or policy. If the FMR is updated and says, hey, I read this cool paper in this uh, IEEE journal from this cyber conference that says the Air Force is doing this RTO and I stuff, and now we're going to update the FMR to make sure they can't do that anymore because it sounds too risky, it's gone. Like, there's nothing enshrined anywhere in current policy that would allow this to uh, continue existing if the DOD decided to change the policy, um, or if the Air Force decided to change the policy. And likewise, that, for that reason, it can be more challenging to adopt in your own, you know, in the Army or the Navy if they thought this was a great idea. Um, so what, what's a more permanent solution? My recommendation is asking Congress for help. Uh, that can be an unpopular opinion, but this is actually an area where Congress wants to do something. They want to do something in cyber. They want increased flexibility. They want us to suck less. They know we suck. Um, and they don't, we're not giving them, at least in the congressional testimony I've read, we're not giving them specific requests. We're saying, oh, well, there's a lot of bureaucracy. We need to streamline things. But that doesn't mean anything. Um, so this, this is actually, what I am proposing is analogous to, uh, there is a exception in fiscal law for small scale military construction. So you know that you need MILCON dollars if you're doing a giant construction project. Uh, but what you don't need them for is if you're doing a small repair or building a small structure you know, that is under, I believe it's a million dollars. And that's because MILCON dollars are inflexible and require a lot of advanced planning. And certain construction projects don't have that planning. That planning is impractical for certain types of construction projects, specifically low dollar ones. Same is true for cyberspace capability development. And so this proposal basically mirrors that uh, existing fiscal exception and would do the same for small scale cyber capability development. Um, my recommendation is $2 million. $3 million sounds great, too. I will take whatever Congress will give us. Um, I have the exact... So, so in the paper that I've, that I've submitted that I think is in the conference materials, may or may not be in the conference materials, it has the exact words of the uh, proposal that I'm recommending, but it does mirror that other, um, that other the construction exception. Uh, it would permit these use, the use of these funds. It would give that flexibility to the operational commander. Uh, more importantly, it's totally apolitical, uh, so there's not going to be like the Democrats and the Republicans fighting about cyber fiscal law. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and it's no cost added, as in this would not cost additional funds to like the DOD, um, or, or Congress would not have to appropriate additional funds for this. So with that, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and if not, then I will cede. I'm Donna Boyce from the uh, headquarters department of the Army. Very interested in your paper. Uh, one question that I had, and it may be clarified in your paper, I'm not sure, but when you said about uh, using it for, or the, that your funds to use them have to be linked to a specific capability or a specific system or um, capability, is that a US system or capability or a f an adversary system or capability? In other words, can these funds be used for capabilities for? both offensive and defensive capability development? So as, as our guidance is written, it's very vague. Um, however, as fiscal law requires it, I would say it needs to be tied likely to a US system because the, the idea is that we are maintaining our system. Um, we do use it for offensive uh, cyber capability development, but those offensive capabilities are generally a tweaking of either something that's available off the shelf, although that's not very common with offensive uh, capabilities, um, or tweaking something that was previously developed and we're tweaking it to, maybe it, maybe it was a capability that went after a certain type of router and we're tweaking it to go after a very similar but different router. Thanks. So uh, I guess statement of the obvious, uh, 
in this case, we're talking about using O&M funding to buy hardware, software, or services for the Air Force? Uh, so the way that it's, you could theoretically do a little bit of all of them. Hardware is going to be harder because it's generally considered an investment item. Um, but I could s foresee certain situations where maybe hardware. Okay. How the Air Force has set this up is pre-awarded services contracts. So we have O&M services contracts and there is a problem and we give it to those people and they fix it. Okay, so uh, here, here, here's a potential scenario for you. Let's say I've got the coolest device ever, which is going to automatically defend your network for you. Uh, I drop it over, you know, in San Antonio for the Air Force and say, uh, please buy this. Who, who's going to be the decision authority to, to buy that box of, you know, let's say it's $100,000 or something? How, how, how does that work? So that authority is delegated to the 24th Air Force commander. He, he's the one. Now, who gets to decide that it's allowed to connect? That's going to be a fight between the 24th Air Force commander and the Air Force CIO. Hi, I'm Nikki Softness, a student at Columbia University. Thank you for your talk. I'm curious in the proposal how you would balance the need for using success metrics to sort of continue to validate the funding with the understanding that a lot of this innovation often has a lot of failure involved. So I think that's actually a challenging problem and it's part of why research and development funds themselves have so much oversight. It's because they don't want to give us, they don't want to give the services a bunch of money for research and development that is not fruitful. And so they, there's a lot of planning involved and with op operations and maintenance that obviously doesn't exist, which makes your point very valid. Um, I think the way that Congress could handle that if they wanted to have oversight is to require some sort of reporting after the fact. So reporting you know, from maybe previous fiscal year successes or even failures or exactly how uh, an accounting of how that money was spent and what it was for. Um, which would allow us to, in real time, develop things, but still let Congress have oversight kind of after the fact. Thank you. Uh, Tanasa from Estonia, Minister of Defense. And I never thought I would be asking a question on, on fiscal law. Uh, but uh, the funds we're talking about are these to be spent only in the in the U.S.? Um, I'm I'm also imagining scenarios where uh, some of the solutions might might be um, developed in cooperation with some international partners, or we can also talk about uh, some foreign deployments of U.S. troops where you have the cooperation with the host nation, and cyber issues are more and more relevant in these terms also. So I certainly think in those joint environments where we are collaborating with our foreign partners, it would be totally reasonable to spend these funds on those efforts so long as they're US efforts. Um, there are tons of restrictions on when we can spend uh, appropriated funds and give them basically to a foreign country or a foreign owned company um, that are way above like my level of understanding of fiscal law. Uh, I know there are regulations. I know it is still possible to do, but I don't know the exact limits of when we could give them to a foreign company or, or a foreign country. Any other questions? Or Thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Dr. Jason Healy from uh, Columbia. So we've got another Columbia person in the, in the group. Um, we'll kind of discuss, if anything, something to help inform policy. Okay, so what do we see is the future permutations of cyber conflict, if you will. So to give him maximum amount of time, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks. Um, that was fantastic, the range that policy covers, right? I mean, we're a public policy international affairs school, and it's really fun to see the range that we've done here just between three papers. So, you know, the, the theme for this talk was the future of cyber conflict. And uh, so fortunately, I had a paper just ready to go when, uh, when, the, when the call for papers came out. Because it's one of the things that I really want to hit. I think it's an incredibly important question on what might be the predominant form of cyber conflict. It builds on previous work. Um, especially a 2010 paper for, um, for Herb Lynn that Greg Rattray and I had done. Um, also some work for the Atlantic Council 
um, including uh, the report on the bottom, where we actually were working with the University of Denver and getting involved in economic modeling of what some of these different futures might look like. Um, what's the overall gains in global GDP from being connected versus the costs imposed by cybersecurity problems? And that led to this paper, which um, uh, hopefully you'll like. So uh, um, Air Force guy, woo, um, and it strikes me a lot. I'd be in, well, a core question that we're facing right now is how do we organize, train, and equip air forces for future aerial combat, right? It's the kind of thing that a military service in the United States deal with. And so I've been in conversations, plenty of conversations, um, including the four-star level where they say, well, you know what, we're not, it's not just gonna be um, RPAs and other slow-moving aircraft in um, uh, relatively easy situations with, with minimal defenses. Um, it's more likely, uh, it's not gonna be like that anymore. It's much more likely to be over very long distances, over very, very advanced air defenses. Um, and that leads them, uh, so they get involved in this deep thought and reflection about what that future kind of cyber conflict, uh, that future kind of air combat in the air is going to be like. And that leads them to say, okay, for example, based on that, um, we see gaps. For example, we need a long range strike bomber. It's gonna to be tough defenses, it's gonna be long range, and so we need something like the new B-21 to handle that. Uh, Army, Navy have, have their similar uh, Marine Corps. Um, if you ask the question, what is, uh, how do we organize, train, and equip for, um, maritime forces or, or ground forces for future conflict in those domains, right? You go through this process, this disciplined process, pretty much except when we're talking about cyber conflict. Again, that's this, the, the tone for today from Army Cyber Institute I really do appreciate because it is trying to bring some structure. Um, when I, when I uh, wrote this over the, over the summer, um, uh, I wish I would have known some of the things that came up today, but right, this is supposed to be the process, right? It might, understanding it might not look like current conflict, but have some deep thought about the future of that conflict, come to conclusions about those gaps. How much are we actually doing this for our field? in this kind of disciplined way. I've been in meetings with chiefs of service that ask, how do I organize, train, and equip for future conflict in cyberspace? And I say, well, what do you think future conflict in cyberspace is gonna look like? Ah, oh, that's not really germane. I mean, what are we gonna do? Um, how's my service gonna look different from what the other services are doing? How can that not be the, the most germane question that we're dealing with here? And even if we are doing it, are we really doing it well? Does that then get mapped into the actual capabilities that we're trying to defend? And it's so important for cyber because as came up, it came up in the last talk, it came up in some of the, in some of the talks earlier today, um, change seems to be far more prevalent in our domain than in the other domains for a bunch of reasons. Um, almost everything that I'm gonna talk about today is in the paper, this is not, oh, they don't, let me, they don't let me talk with, when I, when I talk to students, they don't let me do it with a laser pointer. So this is really awesome. Um, I've, got laser, I've got laser dominance, right? So these aren't in the paper, these aren't in the paper, right? But cyber seems to, uh, change in our domain seems to be much, much more prevalent. So you'd think that trying to think through how the dominant form of cyber conflict or predominant form might, uh, might be different in five years or 10 years or 20 years would be a much more important question for us than it is in the, uh, in the other domains. So anyone, uh, so what movie is that from? Sorry? Right, so what are they showing? So it was a trade, Trading Places, a 1980 some odd movie. Um, uh, Bill Murray and Eddie, Eddie Murphy. So uh, what are they doing here? Where are they? Yeah, it was, it was actually commodities of change. All right, children of the 80s. Um, it was actually a commodities of change, uh, exchange Right, it's this open cry pit of yelling, and you know you're doing hand gestures, and you're and you're signing slips about how much um, how much commodities, in this case, orange juice futures are going to get traded, right? And so when they did the eight, in the 80s, this is how, in, especially in Chicago, this was how it was done. And now, those are largely closed. When I separated from the Air Force, 
Um, I started at Goldman Sachs, uh, has helped create their computer emergency response team back in the early 2000s. And you still had folks in the New York Stock Exchange that would be, that would be doing that kind of thing. And now it's largely done by algorithms. And I'm using this as an example. Um, I was really heartened by this morning because I hadn't heard any other folks using these examples or using these slides. Right, so we saw in finance, what had been done by humans is now done by algorithms. And as you heard in this morning's talk, now you've got supercomputers that can find vulnerabilities and follow internal rules on whether they're going to patch that themselves or use it to attack others. Now we heard today um, from Professor Bromley and from General Nakasone starting to touch on the implications of this. And I like that they're starting to touch on it, but we need so much more done on this, right? Because if it used to be done by humans in the trading pits, and now it's done by algorithms, we're now doing it by algorithms, what does that mean for developing a 6,200 person cyber force? What does it mean for having 19,000 people at Army Cyber Command? Why does General Milley say, for example, well, I suspect it's going to get larger? Maybe it does, but what changes in the dynamics of cyber conflict if now we are driven by, if malware is driven by a supercomputer? And I did like that General Nakasone and, and um, uh, Professor Bromley both did touch on that. Right? Start to work it through. If we go more in this way, what does it mean for our cyber commands? What is, how does it change the dynamics of cyber conflict? For example, I suspect that we end up with far, far more centralized computer defenses than we do today. Because if our adversaries are attacking us with, say, um, a supercomputer-driven Mirai, or supercomputer-driven Stuxnet, or supercomputer-driven X attack, um, uh, APT espionage attack, how can anyone defend against that unless you have your own supercomputer? Um, and who can afford to do supercomputers? Goldman Sachs can, the Pentagon can, um, maybe a few other Fortune 500 can. But in general, if you want to defend against that, you, do we now need managed supercomputer security um, service provider companies? Right? And, and again, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a silly example. Maybe I'm taking it the wrong direction. But this is, could be profound changes in our space that we're not, I'm not seeing these kinds of deep conversations about just yet in how we're gonna try and get there. So to me, it's one of the big questions that I try and ask, especially military leaders. What do you think the predominant form of cyber conflict is going to be in lay out your time frame? Because it's a question that we don't ask very much. And I especially pop it out there um, uh, for students or for junior officers or others to, to ask this kind of question and see what answer you're going to get back. When I talk to congressional staffers, Right? If you're on the Hask or the Sask, this is a really interesting question when someone says, we're just about to go to FOC with our cyber mission forces. Well, are you sure it's going to be there in future years? And, as in, yeah. and so in the, the original paper that I did with Greg Rattray seven years ago and also in the current, there were, there were several supporting questions that I found helped me think through some of these different ways that the predominant form might look like. Um, and, right, and you can see this in depending the choice of analogy that someone uses in this space. Like if they're talking about um, a cyber Pearl Harbor, for example, it's leading them into certain, certain answers here. But they're all very, very different answers. And it leads you to very, very different um, outcomes in what the predominant form might be. So I went through in the paper and saying, well, what are, some of the, what are some of the current answers and what are some other possibilities that might be coming down that we might imagine? Because right, we're still very, very early into the cyber age, a couple decades. So we've got a long way for this left to play out. So one, when I, when I answer this a lot, I w uh, when, I, when I ask this, a lot of times, probably the most popular answer I'll get, cyber will be a part of all, all future conflict, which to me is a crappy answer. It, it, it's probably correct. But so what, <laughs> like the previous one, it's not specific, like the previous talk, it's not specific enough to do anything about. And especially, for example, in the case of uh, early parts of Ukraine, it wasn't even accurate, 
right? We were beginning ourselves imagining it was going to be a cyber fight, and it was an information fight, predominantly. I mean, now, now it, the, the characters of it's changing uh, maybe a little bit. So again, it might be useful, but it's not necessarily all that helpful. Another one that comes up a lot, cyber is a capability. Um, JJ, you're, you're misunderstanding this. And cyber is a capability, which we can use in a lot of different ways to suit depending on what the commander wants. Which I think is, again, it's also true, but it's an absolute conceptual trap. Right, and this came up, uh, and this came up, it was really occurring to me this morning in, in some of the talks that we were having. Right, two armored officers, 1939, a French armor officer and a German armor officer. And both could say the armor is a capability that we can, that we can use for how the commander wants. And one's gonna use it to integrate and help the infantry be better, and the other side is gonna build a doctrine, a new way of war around Blitzkrieg. And, the, and the, um, the tracks of one of those armored officer's tanks ran over the other armor officer, right? So just taking this as a capability is missing these larger dynamics and seeing how it plays out. So it might be true, but it's also not necessarily helpful. Um, so on the left side here, highlighted by my laser, God, that is just so cool to say, is, um, again, is some of the other answers. Um, part of every cyber conflict. Cyber Pearl Harbor 9-11 comes up a fair amount, which if you go through kinds of those questions I had before is probably a, an opening attack, perhaps by surprise. Um, generally, again, if it's Pearl Harbor, then it's against a military target um, to open up a kinetic, um, a, a follow-on kinetic attack. If it's 9-11, it's largely, uh, you know, it's a non-state against generally non-state targets, right? Depending on which of those analogies is used, you end up in different ways imagining what that follow on, um, um, what that cyber conflict is going to look like. Um, continuous attacks is one that comes up. Another answer I get um, often, in fact, I got this once from um, General Nakasone, was that the predominant form is going to be cyber used on the battlefield. Not because I'm an Air Force guy, I say cyber, man, cyber San Miguel. Anyone? Cyber man, San Miguel? No, no, oh man. It was the. Uh, the first time, uh, Battle of 1918, when air power first had a single commander that was operating all aspects of air power in support of a ground commander. Um, and uh, General, General Pershing was the ground commander. I want to say it was Mitchell, Billy Mitchell that was the air commander. So he had reconnaissance, he had pursuit planes, he had you know, the equivalent of close air support. He had all of that was working for one general in support of the ground fight. First time, it, first time it had happened. Um, and so to me, that's a, that's, a, that's a way of thinking about, is that likely to be the predominant way? I hope not. That implies an awful lot of battles. Um, but certainly might be getting across, for example, the way that um, uh, Russia is operating in Ukraine right now. I found there's a bunch of other possibilities that don't really get brought up all that often, um, if, if at all. Uh, cyber Battle of Britain, right? And the Battle of Britain, and I know I'm adding cyber into all these metaphors. If it were me, I'd be totally rolling my eyes. But it does help us think about these different kind of conflicts, right? So if you've already tweeted that, go ahead and delete, like, I wish this guy would stop saying cyber this and that other battle. Um, I will see it. Um, but Cyber Battle of Britain, I mean, Battle of Britain was a fight that was largely in a single domain independent of the other domains. Um, we can imagine that, right? Imagine in this spot, neither nation is willing to necessarily, maybe they don't want to escalate out of cyber, because as soon as one goes kinetic, then they both might go kinetic and neither wants to get there. Or you've got to fight that cyber, for example, in, in the US homeland, or in the other side's homeland, preferably, um, that is relatively independent from how those, their armed forces are actually fighting. Um, leads you to very, very different kinds of conclusions about how do you organize, train, and equip, then, for example, a major co covert cyber conflict, where it's largely, which you could, could say, maybe this is what we're in with Iran right now, or maybe with Russia, right? Each side is kind of stabbing the other with dirty tricks under the table. Each side knows who's doing it, but neither one wants to come up and talk about it, you know, to, to go with it publicly. Um, Greg Rattray, um, my, my longtime collaborator um, and early boss when it was Major Rattray and Captain Healy, he'd always like to talk about a cyber Vietnam, 
back in the early days when that was the only insurgency we could really talk about. Right, long term where an adversary chooses to keep hitting us and taking it down a time and place of their own choosing, maybe it's a non-state, that happens over a, 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 long, um, over a long period. Um, hybrid war, um, heavy use of cyber attacks, um, that was originally what we were, uh, Example for that was um, uh, for Ukraine or what Russia was doing, pure cyber physical fight. Um, for example, if like um, get brought up today with General Milley, right? If, we, if we're in a cyber war with China, there's a good chance, right? We're gonna be in this cyber physical fight and this is all gonna be mixed up or autonomous cyber conflict like I talked about, right? What if cyber conflict in 10 years is all done by the, or predominantly done by the algorithms, um, autonomously is predominantly done by the AI systems What's our role in that? What, how does that change law? How does that change policy? How does that change how we organize, train, and equip? Um, one that I added in, it's not in the paper, um, was cyber-enabled influence campaigns. Because um, that's, that's where we've been getting hit worst in the last year, was the, um, not the cyber aspect of Sony wasn't that interesting. The cyber aspect of the election hacks weren't that interesting. It was what happened to the information that was more interesting, right? They took that cyber capability and we ended up here. And if you come in and saying cyber is a capability, cyber is gonna be part of every next conflict, it doesn't lead you to say, holy crap, they just came to us with a surprising use and all we've got is a cyber command and we started forgetting about information operations and influence operations 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, you know, this, this quote was just from the, uh, just came out in this week's Economist, and they were talking about content on that side. Um, it's it's hard to create a shared open space for political discussion, or even to imagine that such a place might exist. This amazing threat to our democracy that we might not even have a shared open space for political discussion is now at risk, and it didn't even fit into how we thought cyber conflict might come about. It's really surprises me how strangely incurious I find a lot of military leadership on, on, on these questions. So, an entirely acceptable answer is none of the above. It's absolutely fine to say it's gonna be none of those. Let's get out other papers, let's get out other, other thinking on this, especially from the, um, from the military academic um, community. It would be fantastic to find out other ones. If your answer is all of the above, maybe that's accurate. I doubt it is, but if it is, I don't know how we organize, train, and equip for that. And if it is all of the above, is the internet really sustainable? Are our kids, when they're our, our age, going to have an internet that's anywhere near as open, free, secure as the one that we have? Can they, what's the carrying capacity of the internet if that actually is, it is gonna be all of the above? Um, so closing out, I think there is hope to understand the future. Um, the reason to doubt changes, um, more pre prevent, uh, prevalent in this domain than others, but I think there are reasons for hope. You know, we hear network speed, we hear things like that that get brought up, and that's absolutely too, true at the tactical and technical level, but if you, if you go back, you actually see history is, of cyber conflict is much more marked by continuity than by discontinuity. You could take someone from an operation in 1986, put them in a counter APT operation today, and they're generally gonna get what's going on. Um, and I disagree with, General Nakasone on this. He talked about the, the drivers of cyber conflict. He said people, partnerships, and technology. I see is, wrote the first history book of cyber conflict. It's much more driven by the audacity of adversaries. But anyhow, it is, at least it is understandable. Going, drawing a, a straight line is useful. So recommendations. Um, we need a deeper curiosity on this. Um, we need to organize, train, and and equip on the broadest likelihoods and investments for surprise and agility are really gonna be a better use for marginal money than building additional, cap uh, than building additional capability. Um, and uh, private sector is gonna be way better at agility than the United States government ever is gonna be. So if you, if you worry about our being that agile, it's okay, DOD doesn't have to be, the private sector can and will be. Uh, and with that, I think that is it. And that gives us five minutes. Hey. Oh, this could go really well or really badly. Hi, Brandon. How are you? Well, which one do you want? Yeah. Um, new book is out. The name of the book is? No, it's not out till next oh. year. Oh. So we'll worry okay. about that next year. Well, I'm trying but, to push it. You know, as a longtime fan of yours and uh, a fan of history and your approach, 
uh, what I'm curious about is why not look at other forms of conflict? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course... And then just throw a cyber in front of that, no. No. <laughs> of course, looking at other forms of conflict, we know that non-state actors, civil war, revolutionary, yep. is kind of the, the dominant form of conflict. So, you know... That's interesting, Shouldn't we yeah. be learning from <laughs> other observations and taking it from there? Because I kind of think it's going to be the state versus the non-state, not the other way around. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's a great set of lessons. And, and so Brandon is one of the, um, uh, the PhDs at political science and international affairs that's been writing in this space um, and bringing data to it. And, um, and I, I think that's really useful of saying, hey, that's, that's predominant of the non-states, um, intrastate violence and the rest. Um, and you know, you know those better than me. So I, th I think that's a really interesting, I think that's a really interesting point. So it might be interesting for a review or a follow-up piece that, that touches on that. I think that's a good piece. Thank Question you. back here, sir. Oh, hey, great. Hi. Um, so basically, one of your point is if we learn where the future of cyber conflict is, we can prepare, train, and equip for that. But uh, isn't that a bit uh, kind of a interplay between whatever future adversary? Because if you've planned and prepared for one particular piece of conflict, as the United States has overwhelming capability, why would I... Why would I ever fight on that particular field? Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting, but right now I don't even find that we've thought through building out the mission, the, the cyber mission force, right? I mean, the answer is, well, how are we going to prepare? And they say, well, we're going to get the FOC. Well, how do we know that that FOC, you know, that we're building to the right? For example, if influence is going to play it a, lar a larger role, um, as it has in the last, say, two years, we might say, you know what, let's have cyber influence teams that we, that we internet within the cyber mission force that are looking for influence operations that are cyber enabled, like Sony with your DNC hack. It, by, by trying to recognize how it might change or how it is changing, we can then have some force structure ready to deal with it. But unless we're actually asking for the questions of how it is changing and how it is likely to change, and to me the AI and autonomous one is the most important ones. I'm really interested, I, I almost think it's inevitable that we go that way, just like it was inevitable on the trading on the trading floor, um, that the algorithms were going to take over. And I'm really fascinated to figure out who's going to go first. Did the defenders go first by having uh, supercomputer-driven defenses, or there's a huge first mover advantage for an attacker to come out with a supercomputer-driven attack first, and then everyone else has to drive the defenses, right? So, so without a doubt, there's an interplay here, and I'm glad, I'm glad to recognize that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one here then. Uh. Um, so yeah, first off, fantastic presentation. Hey. Um, I'm not terribly surprised, but I'm also very glad to see that you discussed sort of the concepts of uh, the information itself, the very thing that moves through cyberspace and how that might be sort of an element of any sort of future yep. conflict. But I'm going to ask sort of the super tedious question that always just come up, comes up when you discuss cyber, which is what role do you think the private sector, sort of the maintainer and builder of most of the infrastructure yep. that this is happening on, uh, will have upon sort of the nature of that conflict? Um, sort of the innovations that they develop, everything from, mm. you know, the increased focus on privacy and, you know, advanced cryptography to sort of the emerging experimental uh, quantum elements. Yeah. Um, I know it's a tedious uh, question. No, no, it, 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 it is good. And uh, if those of you that know my work, I mean, in general, private sector is the supported command, not the supporting command. They're the ones that have the bulk of, of national power, at least in U.S. and other OECD countries. They tend to be the ones that um, uh, can, can accomplish more in the space than, than militaries. And so you're right, the model that I've done right here is largely based on how nations will choose to fight rather than how private sector organizations might choose to, to, to shape the space. Um, and so that is interesting in that. Um, and, it, and one thing, especially because this came up in General Milley's comments, right? So often when we talk about non-states in this space, our mind goes to, yes, those damn non-states, they keep attacking. And, and that is the general focus when we start talking about non-states. Non-states, you know, the internet is going through an Apollo 13 moment every week. And it's the non-states that are keeping the internet from crashing every week to help keep it up. The Microsofts, the carriers, the cybersecurity companies. And so, so much of our focus on non-states is what is it that we can do to change, their, to, to change the intent and capability of those that want to attack us online. And I think we're much better off thinking about how we increase the intent and capability of those that are defenders and would be our allies in that. And so I'm sorry, I know there's, a, there's some other questions, but we are, we're, we're, well, I can keep going, but it depends on, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dan. I'll keep in mind I have a laser, so. <laughs> the boss doesn't know. 
Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yes. Just lock me in like that. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you.